Good morning. We're going to call the uh, Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting to order for October 25th. And can we begin with the roll call? Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Director Gonzalez. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews. Director Myers. Director McPherson. Here. Director Pegler. Here. Director Rothwell. Director Rockin. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Ex officio Director Preston. We barely have. <laughs> barely, barely it is. Barely it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Mindy Escada will be our Spanish interpreter today. Mindy, could you come up and give us a few words, please? Good morning, I'm Mindy Esqueda. I'm here as the translator to provide services in Spanish. Buenos dias, soy Mindy Esqueda. Aquí estoy para servirle para ofrecer servicios de traducción en español. Gracias. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, this meeting is being televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Our technician this morning is Mr. Lynn Dunn. Thanks for being here, Lynn. Um, so to for, begin with a review of items to be discussed in closed session. We'll be starting with a closed session this morning. So uh, Julie, can you please give us a list of those items? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, we have uh, three closed sessions this morning, two on anticipated litigation, and one on labor negotiations. And do we expect to announce anything out of that? We do. Okay. So with that, we will uh, adjourn to closed session. So we're going to hold a closed session in this room. So we'll just ask you to leave the room. And we will try to be expeditious and uh, invite you back as soon as we can. Thank you. OK, we'll resume a session. And can we get a report on closed session? Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. Hold that. Okay, we'll resume our session. Can we get a report from our attorney? Yes, so the board received a uh, status report on labor negotiations with SEIU. Maybe it should be. Pull it closer. Your mic's not on. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Excellent. The board received a status report on labor negotiations with SEIU, and the board will now at this time discuss and consider for approval ratification of the uh, tentative agreement reached with SEIU. Thank you. Are there any questions of the board? Questions? No question. I'd like to open up to the public. Anybody from the public like to comment on this? Welcome, Olivia. Um, Actually, I'll do it after you agree. Sorry, during labor, <laughs> during labor um, You're comments. You're talk during the, the, at the end of the uh, labor communication. Yes, sorry. Okay, nothing to say yeah. now. No. Okay, sorry. thank you. Anyone else like to address this before we discuss this item? See, and that will close the uh, public session, bring it back for a board discussion and action. Rock, Commissioner Rockton. Um, we, we got a report in closed session about the, the details of what um, the uh, final agreement uh, is based on. I want to say um, these were not easy uh, labor negotiations for good reason. It was a very complicated issue, particularly because of the um, comparable worst study that we've done and, and which was not, frankly, the best study we've ever received in this district. Uh, but. I think thanks to the diligence of both teams, we ended up with a contract that I think is uh, good for the people that work here and good for the agency in terms of uh, not taking more than a reasonable amount of the money we have to provide service to the public. So based on the report that we got and uh, what's in this actual tentative agreement, I move that we approve it. Second. Motion by Rodkin, second by Leopold. Comment by Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to also uh, acknowledge uh, our staff uh, and the negotiating team. Um, I think this uh, agreement reflects that we were listening, that we heard the concerns. And I appreciate the work on, of our management that to, uh, to be flexible enough to try to find ways to make this work. I think that that works well in an organization of our size. I, I appreciate that we were able to do this. 
and I look forward to the signing of the contract and, and moving on with our regular business. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lynn, did you want to speak? Or, oh, your light's on. It's already nice. Oh, yep. Anyone else have a comment? Okay. Uh, before I call for the vote, I, I just want to uh, agree with Commissioners Rock and Leopold. You know, I, I really want to thank SEIU for continuing to, to go back to the bargaining table. I know that this process took longer than we all thought, but, but the effort to keep going back is why we're here today. So with that, um, I would like to call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that contract. Okay, that will take us to uh, board director comments. Any comments from any members on the board? Seeing none, we'll go to oral communications. This is a time when people from the public can talk to us on anything not listed on the agenda. Is there anyone that would like to address the board on items not on the agenda? Yes. Come on up. Okay. Uh, good morning, directors, uh, staff, uh, public. My name is John Doherty. Um, I serve Metro as Accessible Services Coordinator, and I also um, serve in the community as the chair of the Santa Cruz County Commission on Disabilities. Um, I've come this morning to acknowledge the passing, and I have a hard time saying the death, of Felipe de Leon, uh, there's a picture of Philippa being projected on our screens. And for those of you who uh, had gotten to meet Philippa, um, I just want to join you in really feeling the loss. Um, I first met Philippa on the Santa Cruz County Commission on Disabilities. She was a part of a wave on that commission, the result of which for the first time in the commission's history, a majority of commissioners were women. And for a while, um, a majority of, of the commissioners were Latinas. But as far as, but I should really focus on Philippa, because I didn't just get to know Philippa as a commissioner, as someone who went to Watsonville City Council meetings, uh, put across concerns when there were objects, uh, when their sidewalks were being blocked, wasn't just someone who started at the Watsonville Library, a story time, which uh, was continued just a few days ago, um, involving people with disabilities, reading with children, stories about people living with that experience. But also, I want to just, besides being a commissioner, talk about Philippa as someone who, first of all, um, helped the training of our bus operators over about the last five years or so. Uh, she was there in the classroom reminding operators of what she'd seen because she was a regular rider of our bus service and our Metro Paracruise service, how operators had helped people in untangled rough situations so people could get their ride. She was also part of our training of operators when we introduced them to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And Philippa also basically reminded me about the need to bring service to the people. Or to put it another way, Philippa was born in Texas, uh, but made Watsonville her home. And when we met, she lived in Independence Square. And she asked me once to have a presentation at Independence Square. And I said, great, when would you like me there? She hesitated and, and then asked, can you bring a bus? So. It wasn't just a talking head. We brought Metro to Independence Square so people could practice getting on and off the buses. Philippa did a little practice going backwards up a ramp. And I just want to close this by noting the last couple of times I saw Philippa were surprises. On the one hand, Philippa served on the commission. She also served as vice chair. But then she had to leave for health considerations, battling cancer. So I was a bit surprised to see her this last summer at a commission meeting, wondering what we were doing, looking to see if she can help, and giving us brochures that she had gotten from other meetings on subjects including emergency preparedness. A bit of a surprise. Um, another surprise, the last time I saw Philippa, was because I was being treated after hospital, well, 
hospitalized in Dominican Hospital. And one day I had made it out of the hall and I was talking with my partner and then I heard a familiar voice telling a nurse that she heard the voice of some friends outside. So to my surprise, I discovered that Philippa was also being treated at Dominican Hospital and she was just two doors away. So we did get to talk a bit that day of discovery and also the day I was discharged, which was October 1st. And I just want to share with all of you, and part of my last conversation with Philippa, she was mentioning that she didn't see getting back on the commission, but she'd like to continue to be involved. And I just said to her, well, just read the emails and just pick and choose. And so in the hospital was the last time and last place I saw Philippa. So I just want to share with you all of you that she did a lot for Metro. She did a lot for the people that she has met. And um, she will be missed. And if I could ask after oral communications, if, if, it's our, if it's the board's pleasure, could we have a moment of silence? Thank you for, that, for sharing that story, John. Thank you, Olivia. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you. I just want to tag, I'm Veronica Elzey from Santa Cruz, and I just want to kind of tag on to John's comments a little bit about Philippa. She um, always came to Metro meetings. She had a, a quiet way about her, but yet she always spoke up, and she was quite passionate about Metro and getting service where she thought it ought to go. She actually had a lot of involvement in kind of when, when the service cuts happened and a lot of the rerouting was happening with the 79s um, and the 71s. She worked a lot with Barrow and, and other people to make sure that the needs of Watsonville residents were being met. And she um, at one point was um, putting in an application to be a member of the Metro Advisory Committee. She came to several of the MAC meetings she was always a very willing participant. I got to share the experience of being on the team that helped with the bus operator training. Um, she was really helpful there, very involved, and she's really done an awful lot for Metro. So I would just like to take this moment to publicly say thank you, Philippa, for your service. Rest in peace. Thank you, Veronica. Unfortunately, I can't wait for labor communication, so I'm going to go ahead and um, say a couple of things regarding negotiations. I want to thank my team, all the members, for their <laughs> efforts during negotiations. I also want to thank the management team. I think it was really hard negotiations, and it was mostly because of the salary study that complicated the situation. I'm hoping that we can move forward and create better labor relations these next three years until we get to the next negotiations. Um, I think that's important for our members. Our members showed that they were not willing to go on a strike because they care so dearly about the services in the community, and I think that's important to notice. Um, but I'm hoping that we can work closely to avoid grievances and arbitrations that is a cause um, to the public and continue working on our labor relations, but thank you. Thank you also to the board for supporting and listening to our members. It was difficult, but thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any uh, public comment now? I think if you all join me right now, let's go ahead and do a moment of silence right now. Thank you for that. Okay, that'll take us to a written comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Cynthia, go ahead. Quick question um, or comment. Uh, I noticed on the slide, I didn't know for a bit that she has family members, and I think it would be appropriate for the chair just to write a letter to the family expressing our appreciation for what she did for Metro. John's comments are really... Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you for that suggestion. Okay, that'll take us to uh, written communications from the MAC. Any written, no written communications. Uh, any other labor organizations want to address us at this time? Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Um, 
I just kind of want to mimic Olivia's comments. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, listening to us when we uh, are during these negotiations. I know it was a battle, a long battle, um, but we do feel that you guys did listen um, when we had concerns. I do also want to uh, thank my team, the bargaining team, and all the members, and all of the uh, management uh, bargaining team as well. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Any other labor uh, representatives? Welcome, Joan. Welcome, thank you. I, I just wanted to second that and again, thank everybody. Thank you for encouraging uh, everybody to continue uh, to, to try and hash this out. We really appreciate it and here we are today, um, successful. So we appreciate it greatly. Thank you, it's great to have a contract. Any other uh, labor organization members? Seeing none, we'll close that. Uh, additional documentation. I just have one thing here announced that uh, news clips are now available. <coughs> so that will take us to our consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with in one, uh, in one motion. Um, is there any uh, board member like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Seeing none. Anybody from the public like to comment on anything on the consent calendar? Seeing none, I'll bring it back for a motion. I move the consent agenda. Second. A uh, motion by Leopold, second by uh, uh, McPherson. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, consent calendar carries unanimously. That'll take us to our regular agenda. We begin with a presentation of employee longevity awards, and I believe we have four. So uh, I'll let uh, uh, Commissioner Rodkin read these, and I'll make the presentation. We have quite a few people who have served the district for, and the public for 15 years, uh, not, not all here. Um, I believe we've got this in the right order. Uh, Esmeralda Arias, I think is not here, but Paul Camacho is supposed to be here, there he is. Please come on up. Paul worked in IT, uh, IT accounting as a dispatcher at LiftLine prior to coming to work for us and he's been serving the public here for 15 years and we want to appreciate his service. I'd like to say um, thank you for the board and the public. I've been working for Metro for 15 years, serving the community like Felipa, um, bettering the lives of the people who live in this county. You don't realize that Metro makes people's lives in this county better. Going to the doctor appointments, going to church, going to the grocery stores, buying food. Without Metro, their life will be less. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be working for Metro for 15 years and helping the community here in San Cruz County. And thank you for hiring me, and thank you to board directors and Metro. Thank you, and hope to have you for another 15 years. So next, uh, Bonita Kramer, I believe, is not here, but uh, Miguel uh, Escar Sega is, I hope. Miguel's a paratransit operator. He was the youngest employee hired, 20, he was only 20 years old when he began here at Metro. Uh, his dad, uh, uh, Mr. Escar uh, Sr., worked for Metro as a vehicle service worker, and. Uh, Miguel enjoys watching Netflix and traveling, apparently. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I almost didn't make it to see this thing. <laughs> that, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, the Bachelor for recognizing us this day. And uh, second of all, for giving me an opportunity 15 years ago, because what you see standing right here, I'm aged and worn out because of, <laughs> of the work, because of the work. Um, but now they, they, uh, the company, Metro Paracruz, 15 years ago was new, desperate. I, so they, they took a chance on me. I, no, I, I, I guess it, it's, no, but honestly, it's, it's worked out, I guess, uh, if I'm still here. Uh, like the rest of my colleagues, if uh, we've been here for so many years 10 20 plus years we're obviously doing some right but uh it's not so much the years i i focus on the 
Uh, I honestly don't want to come into work uh, just dragging my feet and uh, letting the years, the decades pass by. Uh, I, I'd rather put like uh, value and hard work into the, my upcoming years. Uh, I think that's only fair to, for everybody and for the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Gutierrez, uh, dispatcher scheduler, I think is not here. Robert Maldonado, yeah. another 15 years bus operator, I think he's also not here. Luis Rocha, mechanic two, is also, I think, not here. But Brenda Roman's here, and uh, she's a paratransit operator. She likes spending time with her grandson, with her dogs, and going to musical shows and movies with her daughter. And Good morning, thank you everybody. And I'm not used to speaking in public like this. It's always like a one-on-one -on -one with the, our clients and all. But I thank you for um, the recognition, um, 15 years. And I was 34 when I got hired. And at 34, it was like a job, right? I had to support two kids. Um, but I've learned from, from working here, and it's changed the way I view life and the way I choose to live my life. I'm more considerate towards other people with disabilities, my elders, thinking about my dad and my mom, if they were put in these position, positions, um, riding with us and struggling to maybe get up the stairs to get in our vehicles. And um, it's made me a better person and wanting to be a better person every day and remind myself when I'm driving out there and everybody's cutting you off or, you know, <laughs> or having a triple double and people are not always here where you know, we get a little bit more than we can, well, we can handle it, but, you know, it's just a little tight sometimes. Um, but yeah, I thank you and uh, for the opportunity to have been hired and looking forward to retire from here and physically thank God and that I'm able to stand here today and, and be recognized for these 15 years. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Daniel Zaragoza, who's the operations manager for the paratransit division. Um, <clears throat> he's worked as a paratransit operator, bus operator, assistant paratransit superintendent, <laughs> and now operations manager for paracruz. He likes traveling and watching baseball, but I'm going to go on for a moment. Um, he's also served as a union officer, which we want to appreciate. That's an important part of the work here as well. Um, when he, uh, in his career, went back to Mexico for a while and studied law, which people may not be aware of. Um, he's been married to Luz for 26 years and has two daughters, Alexandra and Montserrat. And uh, his favorite team is the LA Dodgers, which I think is a big, <laughs> a big mistake. But <laughs> it's a big mistake, but that we have free speech in this Mo country. Motion to <laughs> take away the Like Miguel said, I guess they were desperate when they hired me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the way I view my 15 years here at Metro is, you know, if I could put it in one word, it's lucky. I've been lucky. Um, I've been lucky to work here, to find a job that I enjoy in my community, <coughs> being able to help the community. I've been lucky to work with all these great people that are here. Um, I've been lucky to be a part of Paracruz from the beginning. Um, I've just been lucky, and I hope to continue that luck for the next few years. You know? Thank you. And last but not least, even though he's not here, Dennis Baldwin is being recognized this morning for working 35 years for Metro providing service to the public during that time, and we want to recognize that. He works as a bus operator for us. Thanks so much. OK, 
Okay, thank you for that. That uh, takes us to item 17, which is the CEO oral report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Directors, um, I have a number of reports today, so please bear with me. Uh, I'll start off, as usual, promotions, new hires. We don't have any in this particular period, but we will for next month's report. Uh, quick update on the federal uh, authorizations, appropriations for FY20, the year to come up. Uh, the, the report that I gave you last month is relatively unchanged as it relates to the House bill. They're proposing a plus up over uh, the FAST Act uh, authorization, as is the Senate. So that's still the same as it was last month. Of course, that plus up is a plus up over the FAST Act authorization, but it is less than what was authorized last year. Um, for us, selfishly, the hit was taken in places other than bus. So we're still on the bus side being proposed to be plussed up for the various programs that we apply for. Rail and some others are suffering that part that is less than last year. So that's, that's pretty good for us at this point. Um, I will point out that there has been a new wrinkle entered into the equation. Um, this is the federal government and there's full of, full of wrinkles. Um, there is something called the Roskankowski test for the transit account in the highway trust fund which requires Congress to look at the projections of expenditures from the Highway Trust Fund over a period of five or six years and projected revenues against that. And if they're upside down, which they are, um, then the Rostenkowski test says you must reduce next year's allocation by 12%. Well, that's a pretty scary thing that's entered into the equation because for Metro, that would mean about a million dollars less next year. That's a pretty significant amount of money. Um, the nice thing is, in the continuing resolution that we're under right now, they have held the Rostenkowski test in abeyance, and now it just becomes a matter of what happens when they finally do the authorization. Uh, the House side has said, let's, through the next appropriations, let's hold that test out of the equation and not penalize the 12%. The Senate side says, no, let's penalize the 12% and, and uh, anything we do must be in balance and it must be pay-fors in order to, to cover that. And of course, we want there to be pay-fors. It sometimes becomes a question of whether the money comes out of the general fund or not. So that's, that's where that stands. We're, we're through, through APTA, we are lobbying very heavily for the ultimate appropriations when adopted to include holding the Rostenkowski test out of the equation. Um, so I'll keep you informed as, as that goes along. Of course, they're still at a step where the Senate and the House need to come together and reconcile their two bills, which are somewhat different, but not dramatically different. On the state side, a little bit of a more prolonged report because, as you know, we've gone through a process over the last several weeks of the governor either signing bills or vetoing bills. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a bill called AB 723, which was signed by the governor. It got on our radar screen only because it mentioned Santa Cruz Metro in the bill, uh, but actually doesn't do anything to impact us. Um, and what it is, is it has to do with the cities and, and the county uh, may be desirous of putting uh, additional sales tax measures on the ballot in, in the coming years and having to deal with a constrained uh, cap on how much sales tax you can have out there. And um, what happened is the initial interpretation was you have to count Metro's 1979 half cent sales tax, which pushed everybody to the, to the cap rather uh, abruptly. And so this bill says no, uh, and when you calculate and add up all the sales taxes towards the cap, you don't have to count Metro's 1979 half cent sales tax. So that's how we got entered into the picture on that, no impact to us directly. There was SB 742, which was signed by the governor. Um, now this one was one that I think we were the only ones in the state who were potentially impacted by it. Um, I had to lobby heavy through the CTA to, to get language modified into that bill so that uh, we could mitigate down the potential impact to us. And what it is is 
is um, there is Amtrak inter, inter, inter city, state inner city trains operated throughout this state. Uh, they're all operated by Amtrak. They're all operated under JPAs across the state. And Amtrak today is allowed uh, to fund, or the JPAs are allowed to fund feeder service um, to those stations where you can board an Amtrak train. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but existing law says you can only do that for the purpose of your customers who plan to ride the trains. And so AB, SB 742 came along that proposed to expand that, which made sense, particularly to all the inner city JPAs across the state, that in order to make that service more efficient, they should be able to just run an open door, irrespective of whether somebody is boarding that feeder bus to go ride an Amtrak train or just to travel to wherever they're traveling to. They, they should not be excluded from being able to ride that. That's all fine, and that makes real good sense of public use of, of equipment and funds, but uh, this one gave me great concern relative to Highway 17, of course. We, we have a service that is jointly funded by Amtrak that provides feeder service to an Amtrak station, and what we didn't want to have is the ability of a JPA or Amtrak to just come in and suddenly decide, well, we don't want to participate in Highway 17 anymore. We just want to overlay our service, um, and we're going to run it even cheaper than you, you Metro, and, and they could end up you know, damaging our, our service. So we simply argued for some language that made it clear that if, if they're going to ever do something like that, they have to come talk to us about it. So we were able to get that language into that, that law, and I, I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable it's not going to happen, but if it were to ever happen, we have some additional protection language in there. Um, another good piece that the governor signed was uh, um, AB 784, which exempts zero emission transit buses from the state portion of the sales tax until January 1, 2024. Um, I don't know the dollar amount of that, but that certainly will help us in our purchase of buses and make it a little less expensive through 2024 or through 2023. Um, there was a bill that the governor vetoed, which was the uh, Public Employment Labor Relations release time. This bill proposed now to, at a state level, try to dictate release time, and that just was a bad bill. We, as you know, we have release time negotiated with our unions in both of our contracts. Um, that's, it's a local level issue, it's not a state level issue, and so um, I think it was a good veto, actually, because we, we handle it locally. Um, there was a bill, AB 1351, a lackey, which proposed to layer onto paratransit a whole other set of rules um, in, in how you deal with, in particular, how quickly you certify um, paratransit qualified riders and how you deal with somebody from out of area or out of state coming to your, your district in riding. Um, we argued through CTA that uh, that was unnecessary legislation, that there is a standard set by the federal government that we follow, which includes how fast we certify, and we already have a process, as do other paratransit agencies across the state, in dealing with people who come to your agency from outside your agency. Uh, unfortunately, that argument didn't prevail, and the governor did sign that, so we'll have to go back and look at what is in the detail of that and make sure that our programs match up to it. I think it'll be an additional layer beyond what the federal government requires. And then I told you before about SB 397, uh, public transit uh, uh, operators affected by it, passengers with pets. This had to do with the big fires in Napa, Sonoma, and uh, people wanting to bring their pets with them when they were evacuated. Uh, that we, we offered friendly amendments to that just to make sure that we can, we can be involved in that discussion about how those rules are developed through the Cal STA that was signed by the governor. Um, that's, that's good legislation. Um, Gina, if you would put up uh, the Sunline training. We had this opportunity, uh, thank, thankful to Ciro's uh, employee, Rena, who latched on to Sunline Transit down in Southern California, having gotten a grant to uh, develop a program to help agencies begin to understand how to maintain zero emission buses, electric buses. And, uh, and Rena reached out to Sunline and said, hey, we'd, we'd like to, we're get, we've got electric buses coming next year and we'd like to be a part of that free program. And, and so 
um, Sunline said, yeah, we'll make Santa Cruz Metro the beta. And they came up uh, here where they brought two hydrogen fuel cell uh, zero emission buses up here. Um, the pictures are scrolling. We went through, <coughs> was it zero, three days of training? Yes. Three days of training through a wide variety of employees and departments. And uh, it's just a good way for us to um, begin to understand what we have coming next year, which is how to maintain zero emission buses. And um, sir, would you mind showing the plaques that they gave us? I think they're up at the podium there. Um, I will also point out that, uh, let me see if we could just look at the plaques real quickly. They handed out, it must have been 14 plaques, but they gave us some very nice plaques for completing their program. Yeah. So we'll place those around the agency. Um, I, I will just, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and 10 more to go with those. Um, I'll point out that, that if you asked me about hydrogen fuel cell buses um, two years ago, I would have said no, I, I think they're just really, really expensive and, and um, they, they, don't, they, they just haven't performed yet to where we would expect them to be. And that was when we were making our commitment towards zero emission, but battery electric buses. Um, hydrogen fuel cells continue to evolve. They, they offer great opportunity now in range where uh, battery electric buses are still constrained. Our buses coming next year are the newest and greatest thing from Proterra. They're supposed to go more than what the buses are going uh, in range today, which is 120 to 150 miles. We need them to go 300 miles. Um, we think these new buses will go more than 120, 150, but they certainly won't go 300 miles. Hydrogen fuel cell, the next generation of fuel cell, holds a good opportunity for us to achieve range um, that, is, that is comparable to what we need to be able to run. Here's what sort of stimulated this discussion. As we look at our super constrained yard, and you can imagine at night when all the buses pull in and we have 98 buses sitting on that tarmac, you can visualize or, or try to visualize um, 98 charging stations also being in that facility. Not going to be able to do that. Um, and if we do it, it'll, it'll be a very costly structure that'll have to be built likely overhead. So that, coupled with the need for range, is going to cause us now to go on a two-year journey to investigate hydrogen fuel cell and its viability here. So at some point, I may come to you and say, um, we think this is a good thing and we should try to get some of them into our mix and at least start experimenting with them. And the two-year target is, two years from now, we think is a good opportunity to go for a federal low-no grant to try to obtain the money to buy some number of hydrogen fuel cell buses. The Regional Transportation Commission recently heard a presentation about a hydrogen fuel cell, fuel cell train that's going to be up here as a demonstration sometime in the next six months. Uh, they're a firm based down in Southern California. Do you know where these buses are produced? Well, the fuel cells are produced by two right now, New Flyer and El Dorado. El Dorado. 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 Yeah. yeah, it will be interesting as, as, and to see where this goes in transportation. Yeah. It'll be great to see the train as well. It's exciting technology. It's evolved. As, as you probably know, AC Transit just north of us has been experimenting with them for a number of years. Yeah. It gets complicated, uh, and I won't go into that right now, but just getting the fuel there to put in the bus is a really complicated equation. Um, but we'll work through that over the next two years and, and bring you something that makes sense if we do recommend it. Um, this, this bus was really exciting. We took it over Highway 17. We had, we had hoped that it would uh, uh, show a little bit more power than our CNG buses do. It showed relatively comparable power, but that also admittedly is because it's tuned and adjusted for fixed route flat, flat territory. There are some things that you can do to, to potentially get more horsepower out of it, uh, but you got to sacrifice how the fuel cell works. So those are things we'll work through in the next couple of years, but we think that may hold some hope uh, in the future for us to uh, uh, even address our power issues on Highway 17. All right, so finally, in closing, I'd like to see if we can put up one more picture, and then I'd like to ask Jamie if she'd come to the mic and talk a little bit about um, next year's Proterra electric buses arriving on the scene.
So um, we are going to be wrapping the buses with a slightly new look and feel. You can see it up on your screen. There will not be any pink on the buses. The pink is the no-go lines. They're the areas where um, the wrap has to be seen. But this, um, I wanted to, to uh, take an opportunity with these brand new buses to start to rebrand the look and feel of Metro. And so um, it's not a huge departure from our existing look and feel, um, but uh, I wanted to send the message that this is the first of our push towards progress. And um, with these new electric buses, um, as you know, we'll be using the uh, two of the four buses that we received to run the new route in Watsonville. Um, we had talked about wrapping them to be specific to the route, but that always has challenges because one bus goes down, you gotta bring another bus in and suddenly customers don't know if that's the right bus for them to board or not. So we decided to keep the wrap uniform, but this is um, the concept that we uh, is currently in the draft stage. So if you have any feedback that you'd like to offer, I'm available, um, but otherwise we are um, pushing forward with this look for our electric buses. How does this deal with the um advertisements on the outside of the bus where do they go so on these buses for the first year we are not going to advertise on them because we want them to be an advertisement for metro Good. when we are ready to begin advertising on these buses because they are a wrap we'll rewrap them and make space available for advertising that's one of the benefits of going with that model Thanks. so we're Mr. chair we're not looking for a vote but we're looking for reaction if if Is there anyone that hates the scheme? <laughs> I don't think we can go there yet. <laughs> I will try, try, try not to have my feelings. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a great start and a good program. It's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. We really wanted to have those this year a lot earlier. So um, with the implementation, I'm probably going to turn to Isaac on this one, but with the implementation of Synchromatics, I know that the buses will all be Wi-Fi capable, but I don't know if we're actually going to make it available to the customers. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And so... Uh, yeah, the, the capability... The capability will be there, but it's, a, it's really, you know, it's a matter of going through the process of, you know, uh, board approval of and of course um, getting community buy-in and such so as you know it can be contentious with some members of our community so the capability will be there that's the important thing well if it, yeah it, and if it ever is uh, that would also be very good promotion for people who want that while they're transporting Agreed. absolutely we could include that on the wrap yes. yeah. <laughs> thank you does that conclude uh, your report? It does. Okay, great. I just want to go back one moment we, on uh, our longevity awards. We omitted one uh, name, and I'd just like to add that now. Yeah, I was, I was so excited by uh, Dan, Dennis Baldwin working here for 35 years, so I skipped over uh, Israel Zaragoza, uh, uh, air transit operator, who's not here, but we should recognize his 15 years of service. <laughs> Brandon, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, let you guys know on the uh, mission here, Mario Espinoza, 35 years. We'll acknowledge him twice. How's that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll make sure we do that in November. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to item 18. This is a consideration of a resolution to establish the board of directors. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just a quick follow up oh. on uh, Alex's. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, summary of all the electric buses, et cetera. Um, particularly in the city of Santa Cruz, there's so much interest in the all the greenhouse gas, gas uh, reduction, et cetera. So maybe packaging some. Um, summary of all, all that we're doing. I mean, just the awards here, the training, what's coming, the, the, the wrap. Just a little presentation, I think, would be of real interest. 
one of those little short presentations, and I don't know about the other jurisdictions too, but um, we're just getting constant um, uh, public pressure to invest. Every new vehicle is electric, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is a big step. So I just think it'd be good cross-agency PR. The yeah, yeah, just a little short one, summary. How would you feel about me tying that into my state of metro presentation? Yeah, yeah, when, when would the next one be coming? We, we can discuss that offline. The new year. Yeah, <clears throat> but also we do little short presentations at the beginning of the meeting. We can talk about it, but this seems timely and of high interest. Great, thank you for that comment. Yeah. I'm sorry, any other comments on the CEO's report? I don't have yes. a comment on Alta. his report, but since we went back to acknowledge the um, 35 years, I wanted to wrap that up, and I wanted to, um, first, I did know Felipa. I worked in Cabrillo, and I had to coordinate her services with LiftLine, so I'm very thankful that we had that moment to appreciate her as a contributor to our community. And secondly, I wanted to thank you all for your hard work and effort as a former negotiator. I know what that looks like to be in those rooms, and I am thankful that we came to this place where we can get back to that place of serving the community as a representative of Cabrillo, we were um, hit by that, and I'm just thankful that it was not as hard as it could have been, and that since I was charged with a lot of that communications, <laughs> that we were able to do it in a uh, respectful and a respectful way, honoring the needs of both the service providers and the community that uses the service. We didn't lose any um, uh, riders that I know of to date. Our our bus pass sales were actually stable, and so I'm very thankful that we were able to get to that place. And also, I want to make sure that we honor, and that I honor and respect those of you who have contributed those this kind of time to this service because it can get hard. It is a taxing deal to you know listen to the people yelling and the griping, and then you get that one person that just thanks you. And so I just want to be that one person today that just thanks you for your service, for your dedication to this, you as the board for looking over this and making sure that it is honored and respected and is a viable part of our community. So I just wanted to acknowledge that since we went back. <laughs> Alta, Alta, well said, and we'll go back any time for comments like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we're going to move on to item 18. Yeah. This is a uh, consideration of a resolution to establish the Board of Directors meeting schedule and locations for 2020. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Mr. Chair, Directors, uh, annually at this time of the year, you approve your calendar, your meeting calendar for the next year. And um, so this is here before you as planned. I will tell you that there is a slight difference in our normal presentation. I've given you an alternative uh, calendar to look at. So in uh, Exhibit A shows a Friday board meetings for 2020, staying with committees on this, uh, uh, the assumption it's not listed here, committees being the second Friday of the month and board meetings being the fourth Friday of the month. But I'm also offering you for consideration Exhibit B, which would be to move, uh, in effect, committees to second Wednesday of the month and board meetings to the fourth Wednesday of the month throughout 2020. With, the, with some narrow exceptions, you know, um, uh, in May, because of the budget cycle, we moved the meetings up one week. And in um, uh, November and December, I think we move them up because of the holidays. Those, but other than that, we tend to run on the fourth Friday, fourth Friday of the week, and I'm proposing uh, for your consideration a Wednesday scheme. Why, uh, well, from, t from time to time, I'll hear comments from board members, why do we meet on Friday? Um, sometimes it can create complications when it's going into a three-day weekend. Sometimes just because it's a Friday, it can create complications. Um, at my end of things, a little bit selfishly, uh, you have allowed me to participate in APTA and CTA and Cal Act. Um, I'm, an ex I'm on the uh, uh, executive board of CTA and uh, I'm running for re-election right now unopposed. I would expect to still continue to be on that. Uh, but unfortunately, all of their meetings happen on Fridays, and sometimes I'm just not able to participate because obviously I need to be here for our board meetings when they conflict. So from time to time, uh, my, your allowing me to be out there representing this agency on these very important boards and committees uh, does have a conflict on Fridays. But that's not necessarily a reason to make the decision. If Wednesday works for you, it moves it away from Friday. Um, we would love to do it, but it's strictly up to you. If not, you have your Friday calendar before you that you can consider. 
So, so this was brought to just as for discussion, okay? And, and it, it's about you know uh, us getting most people at attendance, whether it's regular meetings or these or committees. So um, I'll just leave it to the board, Commissioner Leopold. Um, uh, thank you for recognizing me. The the question about Wednesday meetings versus Friday meetings, the generally the board meetings don't conflict with any of the ongoing meetings that I have. The committee meetings, however, might conflict on mm -hmm. Wednesdays. Um, because there are, you know, there's, I, I have a LAFCO meeting and a greater decree. There's just a number of different committees and commissions I serve on. So that would be my concern as to whether I could, I could um, do those meetings. Uh, but I don't have a problem with the board meetings being on Wednesday. Um, would you know by next month, John, whether there is a conflict? I mean, you're saying there's a potential conflict, but whether there actually is a conflict with LAFCO or whether is LAFCO first Wednesday or second Wednesday? LAFCO is the first mm -hmm. Wednesday. So the meetings uh, would be on second and fourth. I have a cradle to career meeting on the second Wednesday. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. uh, you know, it's, I don't want to get into it's, your. It's, I mean, I don't. I, don't you, you know, I won't let, lay my life bare, but I'm just saying <laughs> yeah. that there are a couple of things that happen on Wednesdays. Com Commissioner Lynn. Yeah, Wednesdays are not. Good, they're not a good day for me. Um, you know, I'll go with the majority. So it definitely not my business. <coughs> Okay, Mr. Rothwell. Today being an exception, but um, I find that Fridays tend to have less traffic. I come from the way over in Aptos, and since Cabrillo College, oftentimes if you have very good classes on Fridays, there tends to be less traffic getting all the way across the town. Mike, I think you're done. Yeah. <laughs> we heard traffic tends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not usually accused of not being heard. But, um, Traffic tends to be a little bit less coming from Aptos on a Friday than it does on a Wednesday. Uh, I think it's primarily because um, there's not hardly any classes on Friday at Cabrillo College, and so and that's a that's a real spot where it just really gets congested trying to get across town. Sure, um, it's not a huge thing. I mean, I can do it. Uh, it took me a half an hour to get here today, so I can do it. Uh, it's just one consideration. Sure, Commissioner Matthews. A Friday works perfectly for me, and Wednesday is just a mess. I got so many other things going, so okay. that's it. Well, this was over a, a discussion, and if it was a, a, a unanimous decision or something that everybody mm -hmm. said, "Wow, that's great," then I, I think we proceed. But we have before us the Friday option, so mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, whatever the flavor is, let me uh, open it up to the to the public. Is there anyone in the public that would like to weigh in on this? For you, Alex, um, is your meetings with CTA and so forth, um, is that the fourth Friday or is it, I mean, can we? They conflict on both. Um, what I have done on occasion is to, for the committee day, to put Ciro and Angela and others in charge and cover committees and I'll go to the CTA, for example. But if CTA has a meeting and they do sometimes on the fourth Friday, um, I come here and, and I don't go to those. But, Would, I mean, but can we do it the first, the first and fourth Friday? Or first, first and third. third. Or third, excuse yeah. me. Um, we didn't survey that to see if there was any conflicts with other meetings. Gina did a really good job of, of surveying the ones that, that we have, but well, we could got, look at it. And besides, and not just that, but I didn't reach out to the um, chambers to if we went looked at first and third Fridays. Mm -hmm. to Let me go ahead and go over to the public, then we'll bring it back for discussion, okay? I just want to get some way in here. Veronica, this is you. Go ahead now. Hi. Um, I, this time I'm coming to you as chair of your Metro Advisory Committee, and I wanted to ask you a question. My concern about moving to the fourth Wednesday is this. We meet on the third Wednesday uh, quarterly, and 
it is codified like that into our bylaws. So if we're coming close to a board meeting and we have a written communication that the committee wants to send to the board, usually what happens is we have our meeting, I go home and I'm sitting there at 11 o'clock at night and I'm writing it because it's a Thursday deadline to get something into the packet. So if you moved your, your board meeting up two days, we could never meet the deadline to get anything in the packet, which presents some real difficulty since we only meet quarterly. We really try to be current when we send you written materials to the board. So, I, and because that, that Wednesday is kind of codified into our bylaws, it'd be a mess to have to open that up and redo the bylaws. So just something I wanted to bring up, <laughs> something to think about because we want to make sure we have timely communication back and forth. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Appreciate that. Director Rodkin. Would there be a problem yeah, putting this off? Would there be a problem putting this off for one month to check on the possibilities of this first and third option? It sounds like the Wednesday one's got too many conflicts, but I didn't hear anybody think there was a problem other than the last thing we just heard. Mm -hmm. And that might be adjustable so there could be conversation with uh, Mac about their schedule. Um, and you know, double check that there's not some big meeting that would take a lot of our constituents away from our meetings if we met on the first and third, or who knows. I'd rather take a, a month to check it out if it's not a problem to put it off. Should be fine. <coughs> Excuse me, we can still bring it back in November. Move to continue the item till the uh, next month meeting. Before I do, I just want to, Director Matthews, is the first and third, does that affect your Wednesdays? Fridays are all <coughs> open for me, so yeah. Is good. So it, to move, moving to a different Wednesdays yeah. doesn't necessarily relieve and, anything. And just to say, just it's really decision. important that Alex be present at <laughs> <laughs> these meetings where he has a leadership role. <laughs> right. I think we're all trying to make it work. I, I'm just trying to see if there was any more latitude by changing those Wednesdays. But like I said, we can bring it back and have a discussion. Other than that, there were no other problems caused or any other board members? Okay. Then we have a motion by... Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Are we, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I have a motion by Rodkin. Is there a second? Second. Second by Lynn. And so my question is, when we come back in November, should we also bring a um, red line version of the bylaws proposing this change to the first and the third Friday based on whatever your vote turned out to be? Sure. I think that, 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 sense, that, would, that would be helpful that we could tie up all the loose ends. Yeah. Okay. yeah we have some more changes to the bylaws as well um, based on our legislation that yeah. we had passed this year. That legislation is effective January 1. So I was planning to bring the bylaws anyway in November because we don't, I think we're not meeting in December. So we could do it all at the same time. Very timely. OK, okay. good. I have, sorry, I have a wrinkle with the first and third Fridays. Oh. I'm just starting to look at it. I, I can't. Fridays or Wednesdays? Fridays. OK. I'm not going to be able to do mm. those two days. I have work, a work okay. conflict. Well. Unfortunately. And my Wednesday things can probably be worked around. I mean, I do think it's most important that Alex yeah. is present at the meeting. Well, here, here's the deal. We're going to bring back the options yeah. at the meeting in November. And we've all briefed on it now. We can all scrutinize our schedules yeah. and see what doesn't work and what's, at, what, what's possibly flexible. So I think, I think we all consider Alex's appreciation. We recognize the Mac. Becky, I'm going to get you in just a second. I see you there. Um, we're, we're going we're gonna to bring it back and have a discussion, but now everybody's informed, everybody can look at it, we can go. Becky, go ahead and, uh, and give me your comments, please. I just want to say that the first and third fires would present the same problems for the Mac as the fourth Wednesday one. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. I mean, we're we're, we're going to consider the MAC. You know, the MAC's very important to us, and we do appreciate the timely information. So we'll see what what whether this is possible or not, but it's just something we're going to discuss. Director Rodgers. One, th one thing we could think about during this month would be what if this were put, change were proposed to start a year later, which is that ultimately uh, Alex would have a problem during this year, but may maybe... Um, if, we, if we could make the change with enough time, people could switch other groups and so forth. So we should look at that as well next month when we consider this item. In other words, if we decided it's not going to work to change it right now, I, 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 I don't want to leave a long-term problem here where Alex can rarely or often has conflicts with his uh, 
his other responsibilities that is where he's serving this agency. So that, that's another option for us to consider. Not do it, you know, this starting next January, but start it January after. That, something to think about before next month. Yeah, uh, excuse me, Dr. Bakke? Yeah. I don't think that the chambers will know the schedule for the next year. Yeah, if we're going to do this, it's going to be starting in January. Which so that, that, that's. Well, that's we're just starting in January. 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 I, I think I'm just the, looking for a fallback if it turns out we can't make the change because I, I don't want to just leave us yeah. in the situation where the conflict goes on forever for our CEO to try and serve two, two uh, needs at the same time. We are only going to be able to do what we can do. Director Rothwell. Are we locked into Wednesday as being the only alternative? I think that there well, becomes a complicate this a whole bunch more and make it like a Thursday. That, that's a conflict for me. That's an RTC. Okay, conflict. how about Monday? Monday's we can go through this. Let's meet on Sunday. <laughs> I, I think I think we should all come back, seeing whatever flexibility we have for Wednesday or Friday. And uh, if, if if there ends up being no uh, no uh, alternative, then we'll just deal with that. But let's come November prepared to see what what we can do. Okay. And so we had a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, are you against? Okay. That motion carries unanimously to table the item for November meeting. Thank you for that discussion. Okay. Lost track now. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, item 19, Oral Pac uh, Pacific Station update. Barrel Emerson, welcome. Thank you, Chair, Board, Staff, and Public. And I'll make this very quick. I just have four points in my update on Pacific Station. As I gave you a hint last month, City staff is preparing a draft MOU for Metro Review, and the two parties will meet on November 4th for an initial discussion. Number two. Remember that the big picture strategy here is to apply for a California Affordable Housing and Sustainable Community Grants. You hear us throw AHSC around quite a lot. But the strategy that we've come together with the city staff is to instead of apply in the early 20 cycle, we're going to apply in the early 21 cycle. It allows the city to get some, some of the criteria accomplished that just couldn't be done this quickly. Um, and the point is, we're looking to probably apply for 10 or $15 million, and that's the scale that will be necessary to make this a reality. Point number three, once an MOU is agreed upon, one of the imper important early actions will be the selection of a private development developer partner that the two agencies will work with. Lastly, I will be able to provide you a further update at the November 15th board meeting following the early November staff meeting on the draft MOU. That's the end of my presentation. All right. Any questions for uh, Yeah. Um, we just moved to put on the ballot um, for the city of Santa Cruz uh, the capability for design-build contracts. Um, and is that a possibility? I'm just looking forward to a great big, huge project. Um, that might be something to consider if it's a joint project. I will ask Dave yeah. McCormick how that relates to the yeah. rules and the structure. So when it, I see your staff, I'll bring it's it something up. something our water department asked for because of their great big huge projects. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll bring it up and see who will probably already know this, but yeah. I'll find okay, out. Just Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Beryl? Anybody from the public have any questions on this update? This is just a presentation, so no action necessary. Um, Take us to item 20. This is uh, adoption of amendment to Metro's discount fare policy to include a free fare program for the legally blind. Jamie, welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, following last month's meeting, we revisited the procedure for accepting free fares for the legally blind community to incorporate some of the feedback we received. We want to ensure that the community's access to the program is streamlined to the greatest extent possible, while we also mitigate some of the concerns that were raised by our bus operators uh, regarding potential ADA violations or customer confrontations, because of course we want to minimize that to the greatest extent possible. So we continue to support the provision of a card as a means for an individual to choose to take advantage of the access program, but we will also continue to train operators to observe visual cues regarding customers who have service dogs or have a cane, a white cane with them as a, as a means of accepting that individual on the bus uh, if they do not have an access card. We will also continue to work with uh, customers who are in need of a card or have a desire to carry a card 
um, to obtain them. If they have difficulty uh, getting medical certification in a timely fashion, we can offer, uh, offer them temporary uh, free passes or we can pair them with our eligibility coordinator to be evaluated through Metro uh, to be part of the program so that they don't have to seek medical certification. Uh, and finally, we will consider this program a, a pilot program. We will come back in the next six months to report out on the results of the program and how it's proceeding, and we'll continue to take public comment re regarding the application of the program and make adjustments as we deem necessary um, as we implement the new uh, procedure. The um, specific details regarding the changes to the policy can be found in the policy document on page 20A.7 uh, um, if you'd like to review them directly. And uh, once the board has made a decision about the policy, we will, um, in implementing the final uh, policy language, elevate that in the document so that individuals who are interested about this policy change will see it right away when they uh, go to review the policy. And with that, I'm open for questions. Any questions for Ms. Ackerman? None? Okay. Is there anyone from the public that would like to weigh in on this? Good morning. morning, Catherine Fisher from Goldstein, Borgen, Dardarian and Ho. As you know, my firm represents long-term Metro riders who have been denied access to its services because Metro's TVMs are inaccessible to individuals who are blind. It's still our position that the inaccessible ticket vending machines violate the ADA and California law and that Metro should fix them. However, as I said at the last meeting, we support a free fare program as an interim solution to the inaccessible ticket vending machines, but only if the program is a true alternative to the inaccessible TVMs, meaning blind and visually impaired individuals can use the program to ride the bus at all the same times and with the same level of convenience that sighted individuals get from the TVMs. We appreciate the board declining to pass the free fare policy as drafted at the last meeting and encouraging Metro staff to work with us and other community members to come up with a better solution. Unfortunately, the policy before the board today is not yet that solution, although with more time, input from all stakeholders, and further revisions, it might be. As written, the policy still requires a blind access card to participate in the free fare program and says that to qualify for the card, an applicant should provide medical certification as a rule. It's only if the individual takes it upon themselves to express difficulty obtaining a blindness certification that the policy provides that Metro will work collaboratively with them. It's more difficult as a rule to obtain medical certification and go through an application process than it is for a sighted person to use the TVMs. So the burden shouldn't be on the customer to express that difficulty to Metro to avoid the medical certification requirement. And the alternatives listed, like the temporary pass and Metro staff certification, show how the separate blind access card and application process will create unnecessary costs and complications for customers and for Metro. Whether you decide to go ahead with the blind access cards or not, the policy should be clear that neither medical certification nor a blind access card is required to access the free fare program. As the draft policy acknowledges, Metro's bus operators are already trained to allow blind individuals to ride for free without a pass, particularly where an individual's disability is obvious. We simply suggest that the policy build on that training, allow individuals to board the bus for free if they identify themselves as having visual disabilities, whether by presenting Metro's blind access card, using a white cane, being guided by a seeing eye dog, or because they say so, even if they aren't traveling with the appropriate documentation. This is the only way that the program will allow everyone who's denied access to the TVMs to ride the bus at all the times and with all the convenience that the TVMs would allow if they were accessible. It's the only true alternative to replacing the inaccessible ticket vending machines that deny individuals who are blind or low vision access to Metro services in violation of state and federal law. So we ask that you don't adopt the policy as drafted today. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Okay, glad I got the mic. There it is. Never quite sure where to stand with these things. You're perfect. That's the first time I've heard that for a while. <laughs> I think there's somebody behind me that might deny that. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I stand before you again, as I did at the last meeting. And at the end of the last meeting, I was 
quite hopeful because Metro staff received direction from the board to do some outreach to the community and pull together those of us who will be impacted by this situation and have been for many years to come up with a solution that would be viable for everyone and make everyone happy until the PVMs can be replaced. To my knowledge at this point, that directive was not followed. There was no outreach, certainly nothing I'm aware of at least, and I did not hear Jamie mention any either. So that is concerning to me that that was not followed. So the draft policy that has been reworked is actually so confusing. If you listen to Jamie's presentation, it's not really clear even what anyone needs to do. Second of all, I do not need a card to certify that I'm blind. It's pretty obvious. And also, we should not be paying the price for Metro's ADA violations. Might as well just call this what it is with this TVM that have been going on for since it's been in place, actually. We've been trying to solve this for a long time. We continue to, and that's all we want. We're just trying to ride the bus, just like everybody else does. But I find no reason that we should be in any way inconvenienced or asked to do anything extra in order to accomplish that. So I'm asking you to once again direct Metro staff to do outreach to us, to work with us collaboratively to solve the situation. That's what we want. It's what we've always wanted, actually, and what we have tried to achieve and continue to achieve. And I would ask you to put this on hold until such time as we can all come back together here and with something that is acceptable to everyone involved. And there will be no certification with me. I just need you to know and be clear that I need no medical certification to solve a problem that I did not cause. This is not a program of convenience. This is a mitigation. This is a workaround to a problem. Let's be clear what we're actually doing here. That's fine until this can be fixed but I'm not going to carry the burden for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello again. I'm Veronica Elsey, and this time I'm here as me. <laughs> um, you know, at, at the end of the last meeting, I, I have to say I really felt heard, I felt respected, and I really felt hope. I thought we have put in so many long hours and um, worked so hard to try to you know, improve the TVMs and make them usable. And I thought, boy, we're, we're so close. And you are to be commended as a board for being such good listeners. I really appreciate that. As Lynn pointed out, I couldn't find any evidence of outreach other than just the change in the month in your summary, but there's no October dates. Um, I asked around, couldn't find any meetings. And so we didn't get that discussion. And what we got was a revamped amendment that is even more confusing. Um, for one thing, there's now no mention of this as a temporary policy. So if someone comes in a year they're not even going to know that this is a temporary policy. Some of us already have Metro discount cards, so now it's unclear. Do we pay $2 to get another one? I shouldn't be asked to pay for a certification and pay for a card in order to mitigate something that just couldn't be brought up to standards and, and usable. So again, I and I see additional requirements for visitors. You know, I know somebody who showed up on an early Saturday morning because he wanted to go to the boardwalk and go visit a friend, and he was gone by Sunday night. He doesn't have any interest in seven day passes or temporary passes or things that he couldn't get because it was the weekend anyway. So it looks to me like this policy has just been made more complicated, and it strikes me as just a little bit ironic that we're having so much discussion over a free fare when what we're fighting for is the ability to pay. Um, but I would really urge this board, since the board did issue Metro a directive, which it appears that Metro did not follow, please, as a board, you have the opportunity to do the right thing here. Ask 
to, to uh, have the meetings with us. Let's look at 4.6, item three, because right now, well, look, you can either get the certification or you can go have meetings with Metro staff or you can just get on the bus. What do you think people are gonna do? Um, so please, please repeat your directive from last month. Let's sit down with the bus operators because it's now, it's more confusing and you've only got a week to implement it you can't train your staff in that amount of time on something this complicated. So I would just really urge you to not adopt this resolution. Um, at this time, we're, we're willing to work with you. We were in October. We were looking for that opportunity, and we're sorry that it didn't happen. So again, please, please, this is not a perk. This is not a bonus. This isn't something that is gonna last forever. It's a workaround for a problem that doesn't seem to be able to be fixed right now. Please treat it like a workaround and keep it out of the policy because then it's gonna be a mess to rewrite this whole thing in whatever time, you know, three years or whatever it is. You're gonna create a bigger mess for yourself. So please keep it as a separate item, just list it as a workaround and then repeal it when you have accessible vending machines or whatever equipment available. Do not pass this resolution. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Is there anyone else uh, from the public like to speak on this? Or rather, uh, first I want to thank Sarah and Jamie for meeting with us on the issue. Uh, provided a lot of clarification. They got good input from us. I think we made a lot of progress on it. Um, at this time, we've gone through all of what my concerns were, what James' concerns were. Obviously, the public still has some other concerns. It's not really for me to comment on. Um, our training already includes having, you know, an awareness of each individual that comes on the bus. So I'm not super concerned about being able to implement any kind of new training in this uh, situation. Should be able to get done pretty quickly. Um, I think that this gives everyone a lot of option, right? It gives them a lot of options on ways that they can go about getting an access card or you know if it if it is something that's that's obvious we'll, we'll be able to handle that so I think that a lot of moves were made in the right direction and um, you know as far as me personally concerned not having the same perspective as some of the members of the public I don't have any further concerns with the program thank you thank you for those comments anyone else from the public like to weigh in on this Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. I just want to ask a quick question to the city attorney. Uh, based on the presentation that was made, were there nuances, because it's very difficult, okay, just for me, I'm trying to digest what the changes are. Based on what was asked for, um, were there, are there nuances that they presented that, that we should be, that, that we were unable to deal with? Or is there anything else you'd like to give us guidance on before we have a discussion? Um, so I, my recommendation would be to move forward with it, the policy at this time take a look and see how it works for the next several months, see how members of the community are, you know, handling the, the changes to the, to the discount program, and then revisit, you know, it's a board policy, you know, you all are entitled to make changes to it at any time, and if we get feedback from the community that there's any difficulties, uh, particularly with folks who don't have a card, they won't be required to have a card and they should be able to get on the bus. If there's an issue with that, then we could look at making further revisions to the policy. Thanks for that input. Yeah, go ahead, Jane. Yeah, could I add something? Um, the card is not a requirement for ind individuals who uh, can clearly be identified as blind by our trained bus operators but it is a protection for individuals who either do not wish to indicate that they are blind verbally or do not physically represent themselves. You know, there's not a way to visually identify them as blind. That having that card would protect them in the event that a bus operator was not clear that they qualified for the free fare program and asked them whether they have a card, they would be guaranteed the free fare process. However, for customers, um, who are able to be visually identified as blind bus operators would be able to allow them on for free. Great. Don, you have a question for oh, And please. just, yes, to clarify, if they feel comfortable in saying, uh, you know, I, have, I, I am blind or I have sight disability, 
they would be admitted as has had been requested by a couple of our speakers. They could simply say that if they're comfortable, the card would allow them to uh, be able to present something and not have to verbally claim that. I think the reason that there's, I appreciate the question, uh, Director Lind, and I, I think that the reason that there's some nuance to this policy is because uh, human behavior is not straightforward. Um, so certainly our bus operators make every effort to work with an individual when they board and, and say that you know either they are not paying the fare or they believe they're eligible for a discount fare. And sometimes they will they will warn them like, okay, you know, gonna let you on this time, but you should try and investigate this program, getting a discount card, for example, if they're eligible for that in the future um, so that you don't have this, this incident again. And, and that's what we would direct our bus operators to do. And the reason that that's important is that while the vast majority of our customers are honest and just trying to get where they're going, there are instances where people take advantage of our policies even today. And we have to build in some kind of protections for the district to avoid individuals who learn that they can just say, I'm blind and I deserve to ride for free from taking advantage of that policy. I know it will happen in probably just a very, very rare number of occurrences, but the fact that creating that kind of a condition would create a new set of problems for our bus operator is the very thing that we're trying to avoid. And it's one of the things that frankly created a bit of a challenge last month at the board meeting because um, one of the things that the bus operator said was we, we want to minimize confrontation, but we also want to do our job, which is to collect fares from appropriate passengers you know, as necessary. So this gives them a vehicle to do that uh, while minimizing confrontation. Um, can you make comment about the outreach? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we're hearing that staff were outreached, but we're hearing that the public didn't feel that there was outreach since the last meeting. So we, um, and perhaps this was my misunderstanding of the direction that the board gave. We did extensive outreach in September, um, and I was under the impression that we were directed to um, attempt to make contact with the individuals who spoke at the meeting on the policy, and I believe we did attempt to make that contact, but no, none was... Uh, yeah. That's not accurate. The clarification is we sent the revised policy to their attorney. We, you know, through, through legal, I can't make contact with the individuals personally, so we went to their attorneys. Director Matthews, did you have a comment? Or? Okay, good. Uh, Director Wright. Um, I think in, in effect, we have made the changes that were asked for, but they're buried in um, 4.6.A. And what I would propose is that we approve this, but we look at uh, number 2.2, uh, .2, which is right at the beginning about applicability. Um, before I make my particular suggestion, I'm just going to say this is temporary, but I don't think we need to make a big deal about that because when I think our plan is not to replace those machines. But we're hoping, and we'll find out, but to hope that, in fact, what will replace the machines is the use of cell, uh, use cell phones or you know, uh, smartphones or whatever to be able to make this access. And if that's the case, we've got a bunch of other changes we need to make because nobody uses, I mean, there's a lot of other things those machines are used for that are not problematic now or whatever, but there's going to be new policy language. So what I think we should do is actually right up front in the policy under 2.2, and I, I'm, I'm going to propose a concept, but get if the and with a motion if it passes had direct the staff to give the exact wording and the wording should be taken from the videotape being made of this meeting from the comments people made to us but under 2.2 i would say there are three ways for visually impaired individuals to uh, access the bus the, this uh, this policy first of which should be if they present as obviously uh, visually impaired or blind um, they should be allowed to enter the bus that's number one, number, which is what people are asking for. Number two, they can get a card uh, through the a medical provider. And number three, they can get it in the, uh, through our staff if they're getting it through a medical provider is a problem. And if that's done, under, again, with better language than I've used right here, under 2.2, right at the front of the policy will be what people are asking us to do. And I think that does address the issue. Then what I would propose is that after that length, is that the staff go out with that language you know, the, the actual language, not the concept that I'm proposing, 
to the uh, people that have spoken in our board meeting as well as their attorney, um, or have our attorney talk to their attorney, but to have our staff talk to the individuals directly, and just see, is the, is the, is the language doing what I'm trying to do here? In effect, do they believe it's solving the problem the way they've asked us to do it? If, there, if there's agreement, there's no reason to bring this back to us, but if there's a problem or issues, then, and again, we're gonna, if the, the policy recommendation here is to come back in six months and see how it's gone, but if there's a problem in two months, we should bring it back in right. two months and not wait six months for it to be worked out. But that, that's my proposal. I'm gonna wait for other comments, but I'm prepared with a motion that would basically say, let's take the concepts that are, what people spoke today and what it's over there in 4.6.A, and move them under 2.2 right at the beginning. This is our policy for now. And rather than say it's temporary, it's the policy. And when we change the uh, situation, we'll have to change the, the, this overall policy. We'll get some other amendments as well, I'm sure. I have a motion by Rodkin. Is there a you second? You do a motion. Okay. Yeah. I, was wait for yeah. I have a motion by Rodkin, and the second was, thank you, Larry. Um, I just want to clarify, uh, summarize uh, what uh, Commissioner Rodkin said, and that is, is that we're going to ad adopt this policy <coughs> with, with a uh, amendment to the language to pretty much highlight and enunciate up front in the beginning what the intent of this package is so that, that, that I think we understand what the public's commenting and we're trying to address that. So there will be some, some language created by uh, probably by Jamie or by legal staff that, that highlights this. So motion a second, continue discussion, Commissioner Leopold. Just for clarity's sake, um, it, it, in my understanding, with this language change and everything else, someone could still come up, uh, 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 appear at a bus stop um, with their white cane or with their uh, or acknowledging in in some way or or uh, getting on the bus, uh, um, and they could ride the bus for free if they were blind. Correct. And there's also other things, so they don't have to um, acknowledge that by they get a card or uh, or card something in two, else. Card in two different ways, either by being certified by a medical practitioner or coming to see our staff and avoiding the necessity of having a medical person do it. But they could get on the bus if if, if with no card, if, with no card or anything else. That's that's the motion. I'm comfortable. And, and I think you know, just to add to that, I think what there's is if a person comes onto the bus and they present as legally blind and is acknowledged by the bus operators, which have now bought into this conversation and saying that, they, that that's sufficient at this point. There are, are additional things that we deem, but that is sufficient to allow that person access to well, the bus. Well, I'd just like to add that it would be helpful to come back in January or February meeting uh, with uh, the folks who are here today, an actual meeting. Um, and uh, and anyone else to just sort of see how that's going, you know, it would it would just be super helpful for us to know whether it's actually working or whether it's something we have to um, we we have to adjust. And uh, that's uh, a friendly amendment. And would that be a friendly amendment yes. to the motion? And the second, Larry, yes. that's good. Okay, good. I think that pretty much summarizes. Any other comments, Kaufman Gomez? Um, excuse me. I, I know that staff had made the comment of um, the the training that they're having. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we are adequately training the staff to be able to recognize those that may come forward and identify themselves as having this kind of disability um, so that we don't have any barriers that they have a new bus driver and they don't know what they're looking for or to acknowledge that that particular person would be eligible under this policy to have the, the free service provided. I believe the bus operators acknowledged that. Was that part of your comment? We are, we yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Well so, trained in that area. Okay, and yes. all new and drivers. All, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Standard you for that. And once every year for our BTT service. Okay, good. So it's part of the education curriculum for the staff. Donna, your light's still on, or do you have a comment? Or any, any other comments on this topic? Okay, with that, we have a motion by Rodkin, second by Pagler, and friendly amendment. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that discussion. Okay. Um, takes us, uh, brings us to the end of the meeting here. This announcement for the next meeting will be next Friday, it'll be on Friday, November 15th at the Watsonville City Chambers. And with that, oh, Rothwell, go ahead. This is a little retroactive, but. Um, we thanked the management team during the negotiations. The SEIU uh, was, I think, very um, 
affirmative in terms of how the final contract came out. Um, but I'd just like to recognize the fact that Alex took a tremendous amount of uh, flack during the procedures and negotiations. And um, I'd just like to thank him for not only taking it, but uh, coming up with what I think is a fair contract. And I think he worked really hard to make it a fair contract in really difficult circumstances. So um, I appreciate that we thank the management team, but I'd like to thank Alex. I'm not used to thanking administration and management. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> um, especially coming from a strong union position and, and being a chief negotiator for my own union. Um, but I think Alex deserves um, uh, our praise in what he's uh, come through and the final outcome especially. So yeah. I'd just like to recognize I, that. I, I, will tell you, I will tell you that uh, I had numerous conversations with Alex during this entire process and what you, what you identified was true and, and lots of extensive time Alex went back and forth creating, trying to find a way to, to work to a solution which is where we are. So I appreciate that you, coming from you, you make those comments and, and they're well said. So thank you for those. And thank you, Alex. And you had your, before I was going to adjourn the meeting, you had something you wanted to say. That's correct. And okay. And there's also a photo. I think it's a photo op. Photo op is first. Well, and photo op. If, if you're going into the MAC advisory committee, please proceed, and we'll take everybody who is not in that committee first. Okay. And if there's anybody who has a time commitment and needs to get out of here really quick, Let, put your hand up, and we will take you very first, so. Okay, so Donna's first, okay, so. Um, After the MAC. And, and the then, Mac uh, but, so with that, uh, the MAC committee will meet, the pictures will stay here, and thank you everybody for, for staying for the pictures, and with that, we are adjourned, thank you.